Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, marine stratocumulus clouds, and uh, so we're down a little bit closer to the surface than we have been so far in the first uh, two talks. And uh, my uh, interest in these and our interest in these has been uh, sort of a long-term uh, project. Uh, it started out uh, back in uh, uh, 1976, I guess it was, but uh, let me just give you this uh, introduction here too that uh, one of the things that we see of course is that uh, we see lots of aerosol cloud interactions or at least uh, aspects of that when we look at the satellite imagery and uh, here's just a sort of nature's way and man's way as I call it and the ship tracks here are good evidence that uh, there's some modification of the clouds that's been that is probably associated with aerosols uh, less clear as to what the aerosol rolls are in the pox and rifts if just by looking at it, but uh, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, uh, later. So just a little bit of a history, as I said, uh, 1976, I was a graduate student uh, working with uh, actually Doug Lilly and Wayne Schubert at that time, and they had four, five flights with the NCAR Electra that we got to fly out over in the first time uh, looking at some stratocumulus clouds. And part of this was stimulated by Doug Lilly's work with the simple mixed layer model, uh, of stratocumulus clouds, it was in 1969. And so they, uh, the, 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 the uh, awakening here, though, when we got out there on this one flight was the drizzle on the windshield flight. Now, this was before the real-time displays of cloud particles and everything else going on, and we're going in these little wimpy clouds, uh, they're a couple 300 meters thick, and we've got rain, or drizzle at least, uh, in these clouds. So as that sort of that point, we did realize that uh, it, maybe cloud microphysics are important in this whole process and that it's not just simply a mixed layer where the turbulence and everything else pretty well takes uh, care of itself. And uh, you can see just from the satellite, this is a satellite image, just the, uh, the natural variability is fairly large too. So uh, Doug Lilly, he, he was the one really coined this idea that marine stratocumulus is it's a great natural laboratory because uh, the synoptic variability is weak and you have these nice uniform cloud decks, except that there is a certain level of natural variability within these clouds, which does complicate this problem in terms of a natural laboratory. And uh, <clears throat> we even speculated that uh, on these cloud trails that uh, one would expect sort of a narrow drop at distribution, less drizzle and enhancement of the cloud. Uh, we didn't have measurements on this particular flight in the cloud trail itself, but uh, after uh, realizing what uh, we were sampling, Compared with some of the other clouds, we, uh, we had sort of speculated on that. And since then, there have been uh, different uh, 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 studies which have been done to look more carefully at these uh, ship tracks in particular. And I call these sort of uh, reactive inadvertent probing because uh, it's hard uh, when you're out there and uh, you get your airplane ready to go and you fly out and you have to find a ship track. Uh, so there may or may not be one there. So it's, uh, it's always a difficult problem. But... Uh, in the MASP, which was the uh, Monterey Area Ship Track Experiment in, I guess it was in 94, uh, they were able to make uh, several aircraft penetrations and characterize the aerosols. And here's just an example uh, showing here from uh, the uh, ship track. We can see that uh, the cloud uh, droplet concentration goes uh, dramatically higher in the ship track itself, as with the aerosol concentration. Uh, droplet radius goes down, albedo goes up, so consistent with the Toomey type uh, approach to that. Uh, since then, there have been several satellite studies, and Jim Coakley, of course, has been going hand in hand with that. So we have new tools now that, which can also help uh, use these. But again, uh, this does serve as a natural laboratory because there's clouds out there in our ships, and so we have these ship tracks that we can study. And I won't go, and here's a more recent study that was, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, Christensen and Stevenson have done where they've actually used Calypso to look at these uh, ship tracks and look at uh, the processes that are going on there. <clears throat> uh, as far as the, uh, the natural variability, uh, it, how does that affect with the aerosols? Uh, again, a little serendipity here that we had a chance to fly across one of these uh, rift or pox areas that you can see here. It was just off the coast of California and uh, flying along uh, in this direction here. Uh, fairly solid clouds, uh, more broken clouds. And the interesting thing is if you look at the uh, CCN concentrations, that uh, they're 50 to 60, so that's still pretty marine, and there was some drizzle at the top of the clouds. The cloud, but uh, if we go into this area here, uh, the CCN goes way down. In fact, there was one where the CCN went to zero, and Hoff Janssen was uh, uh, hammering the instruments, and the ultrafine went way up, and so there was new particle production and everything else going on. 
So uh, these clouds can be very efficient cleansers in some cases, and I think there's some further evidence of that in some of the more recent studies that have been done on here. And, of course, here's, uh, here's Danny's uh, work where he uh, looks at some of these variations in the uh, stratocumulus clouds that may be associated with the, the aerosols, and he has his uh, ideas on how that works. More recently, the Vocals Regional Experiment, uh, this is Rob Wood was the lead scientist on this, but it uh, gave us an opportunity to look at uh, some of this natural variability and also some of the, 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 uh, the man-made uh, pollution sources as effects on stratocumulus clouds. And this was in uh, 2008, a very successful experiment. And uh, you may have heard Rob's talk yesterday. Uh, one of the things they were looking at, we're looking at these pox areas. And again, uh, they have found, uh, here's just uh, showing the same open cells, closed cells, and here's with the Wyoming King Air uh, radar showing the difference in the characteristics of the clouds in these different areas. And they were also able to find these very large differences in the aerosol concentrations with some ultra clean, very clean air uh, along some of these edges of these, of these clouds. So I would point you to the paper that Bob, uh, Rob he presented yesterday, and there's also a, in the uh, atmospheric uh, chemistry physics journal uh, on this. Um, the other part of this from the vocals perspective is that uh, there are these natural sources, uh, or the unnatural sources, I guess is the other way to call them, or man-made sources of aerosols, uh, that uh, this is a modus image showing the droplet concentrations in the stratocumulus cloud, and you can see this uh, area in here, which uh, looks as though it's being affected by a couple of things. Santiago uh, as a source of uh, aerosols. There's also these uh, copper smelters along the coast here, so it was speculated before vocals, at least, that they were contributing to these aerosols and thus modifying the clouds in that area. So we took advantage of that. We used, the, uh, again, the Surpass Twin Otter, and uh, we had a very... Uh, we, could, we don't have much range with that aircraft, so we ended up going to every day to 72... Uh, west 20, uh, 72 and 20 south. We call it Point Alpha because we, uh, by name. And uh, just to show you uh, how consistent at least some of the boundary layer structures are, that normalize the cloud top height here. But in general, we found a very, very consistent boundary layer structure. Here's some moisture above, and so some of these cases. But there was a rather large uh, variation in the liquid water content of these clouds. But again. Uh, pointing to the fact that we can use this as sort of a laboratory in a sense that we don't have a lot of variability, at least in the boundary layer structure. But what's interesting, though, and uh, that the liquid water path, uh, the red points here are from the aircraft and the other points here are from satellite estimates, from those satellite ep estimates. And we did find that there was this relationship, uh, liquid water path versus CCN concentration here. I'm not going to try to explain why it looks like that. And uh, also points out that there are other things which do affect the liquid water path and the aerosols in unison. So one has to be careful in this natural laboratory in understanding how that's worked. So we're trying to dig into this and understand that. So again, the case. So that takes us to a little more a different uh, idea was uh, the more proactive, what I call proactive probing or cloud seeding. And... Uh, Sometimes we, uh, we've tried to avoid the use of words like weather modification or other things when we're doing these experiments, but uh, we go, so we call it proactive probing, I guess, or cloud seed. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> this uh, uh, may look familiar to some of you. These, these are flares on the backside of an aircraft. Sometimes when I show this slide, people think the airplane is on fire, but it's not. And uh, we uh, actually did some seeding in this little area in here. And uh, this was these flares of... Uh, uh, Ruloff's uh, uh, had uh, some description of these flares and the characteristics, and Dan Breed has been associated with aspects of this. So the idea is that uh, these ice flares uh, put out some larger salt aggregates, which uh, serve as giant nuclei. And what's our idea here was to see if these giant nuclei could change the droplet spectrum and uh, in the way that uh, the theory is thought. And... Uh, so there are some ideas that the drizzle starts in these clouds due to giant nuclei, but it's always hard to do that in the natural laboratory because it's hard to sample those things from natural processes. So uh, our strategy here was uh, we had tried this a couple times and with, without much success, but uh, we found the key was we made two uh, lines here of flares. And uh, initially we had done this with one, and it was always difficult to say, well, did we do something or didn't we do something? 
And the nice thing about the flares is they, in addition to the giant nuclei, they also put out a lot of small particles. And uh, those were fairly easy to see in the PCAS instrumentation. So the, the uh, people on board the aircraft could actually track the PCAS. And in doing so, if you look down here, uh, we could see these peaks. And the, the key was we saw two peaks, two peaks, two peaks. So every time we saw two peaks, we know we were crossing these two plumes. So the plumes are advecting with time. So to keep track of where we were going. So you can see this kind of a strange pattern that we flew around here, uh, probing these two tracks as we're going along, using the PCASP as the markers. And uh, <clears throat> the interesting, the, the nice thing about this compared to some other ways in which uh, you have to do scene experiments is we have the background right there. So here uh, is the uh, droplet spectra in the background here. So that's well characterized. And I'm just going to show some of these later. Here's 14 and 15. So this is actually the same plume. It's just being sampled as the aircraft comes around and samples it again here. And you can see the broadening that has occurred here in the droplet spectrum. And we attribute that to the addition of the, the, the giant nuclei in, in, the, in this process. And here's just another way of looking at it. Uh, here's the cloud effective diameter from the beginning here. Uh, here's the background. And uh, we also the, uh, the cloud spectrum width you can see is sufficiently enhanced here. One little bit puzzling part of this is that one of the plumes showed this and the other one didn't, so we haven't explained that exactly. But another thing to look at is the volume of the uh, volume ratio of the 20 to 40 micron drops. Uh, compare that with the background, and you can see in this plume that that uh, ratio goes uh, here starts out near one during the first plume and it continues to grow as, uh, as time goes along. So we were encouraged by that, and uh, this was more, more of a demonstration as much as anything else. And uh, the, the, the idea here is that we have a nice, stable background. So even though it is local there is variability in the clouds, locally it can be fairly, fairly constant. So we were encouraged by that, and uh, we saw this clear evidence of broadening. So we uh, had some ideas for some potential future studies, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, in, uh, as we're going along here. Now, cloud seeding has also been uh, suggested as a geoengineering. Uh, the idea is to uh, add CCN and brighten these clouds, and the clouds that would be most susceptible to this, of course, would be these stratocumulus clouds and other marine clouds. I'm not going to discuss the merits of this uh, idea. Uh, as you, can see, you may have seen this uh, concept idea here that... Uh, these uh, droplets would be produced through uh, uh, fine sea spray, and that those uh, would then, in, in a sense, be the source of CCN that would, uh, would brighten the clouds. Uh, so while there, there's many aspects of this issue that I think are, need to be looked at very critically, and uh, I think in that respect that the stratocumulus clouds do a, give us an opportunity to do that. So, we uh, have some future plans here, and this is uh, coming up in um, uh, July of uh, 2012. And the idea is here, we call, again, we call this controlled aerosol perturbations in marine stratocumulus clouds. And the idea is uh, to test uh, some of these ideas. We're going to do some CCN seeding from ship for cloud brightening, drizzle suppression, uh, some giant nuclei seeding, again, a uh, different uh, idea here, uh, looking for... Uh, cloud droplet broadening and drizzle, drizzle production. Uh, controls, uh, ideas a little more control seeding uh, in terms of the size, composition, concentration. I say that a little bit, uh, not quite as controlled as we'd like, but at least we can characterize some of these aerosols. Uh, the effects of background aerosols on cloud response is important. We know that in certain conditions, for example, with a giant nuclei, if we have a cloud that's precipitating, the, uh, low CCN concentrations that the giant nuclei are probably not going to have very little effect, at least the modeling work that uh, Graham Feingold and Bill and others have done has indicated that. Uh, so uh, the same applies to the uh, application of the CCN themselves. So uh, we're interested in that and we're in uh, understanding how the background affects these responses. And of course, there's uh, different, uh, there's other issues here which uh, come up in terms of if we have CCN sources near the surface in a well-mixed boundary layer where versus a decoupled boundary layer, of course, these processes are very different, and so we need to understand uh, how, how, that, how that works. So this is uh, what we call this seeding for science. The, the key here is cause and effect. It's so difficult if you're using satellite or if you're using going out in the field 
how do you establish cause and effect? And so the idea here is to produce a source and then just try to better understand uh, the cause and effect. So here's just a little idea of how this will work. Uh, the dispersal will be from a ship that will be off the coast, and uh, this is a picture uh, showing, indicating this is one of the ideas is to flow the, do a pattern like this. The twin otter will be the, inst the aircraft that will be used. Uh, we also, from the aircraft itself, we have a way of uh, dispersing giant nuclei, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And uh, another key part of this is that the Twin Otter now has equipped a uh, FMCW cloud radar, which is very sensitive to uh, large drops and drizzle. And so this will also be a very useful tool in characterizing whether drizzle is being suppressed or produced or how that's being modified. In addition, on that uh, aircraft, we've also developed and tested, actually, a technique for uh, putting out radar chaff. And uh, the chaff is cut to three-quarters of a millimeter, uh, so it has very slow fall velocity, but it's uh, optimized to be seen very well with a three-millimeter radar. It's a quarter wavelength. And uh, we will use this as a, to, uh, basically as a markers. So uh, sometimes it's hard to figure out uh, when we put down these lines where we really put it down, but we can use this as a marker that can then be detected by the, the radar. Well, here's the smoke generator that's, uh, that uh, Lynn Russell has uh, rustled up here. Uh, this is uh, it's not on a ship right here, but uh, this is going to be our CCN generator. Uh, not very pretty, but uh, apparently it makes a lot of smoke and dust. And uh, for, for you can see why, I guess this is used by the military. That's why I forgot to mention that, but it's pretty obvious. Uh, the other, for the uh, giant nuclei here, this is, I, we owe this uh, to, to Danny here. And uh, he has his milled salt. And uh, here's uh, some of his uh, pictures that I've shown here of uh, here. So uh, to dispense that, we've uh, developed what we call a salt machine. And so this is sort of a... Uh, this is sort of a farmer's engineering project, the way we've done this. But uh, we have a, the salt is in here, and uh, we uh, then have an auger feed so we can adjust the feed of the salt into a fluidized bed where we have a grit in here. So there's a flow in here, which the grit, uh, the idea is that the grit itself will knock apart any of the salt particles that are sticking together or do anything else. And then it's ejected uh, out this tube here so we can eject that out the uh, window. So we can, in this way, do some adjustments to it. I have not tried this on the airplane yet. Uh, Hoff Janssen has tried in his lab. Initially, he was, had the hose going out the window. We were making a nice salt cloud. But uh, he, in later tests, I understand he did it without that, and he filled up his lab full of salt. Uh, so uh, you, have to, you do have to be careful with the salt, too, I guess, because electronics don't really like it so much in some cases here. So, so anyway, this is, uh, this is our plan. Well, okay, so uh, that little speculation here. So I, I'm going to end up here pretty soon. And... Uh, uh, one of the problems that we see, you know, we, uh, the, in the stratocumulus clouds themselves, a lot of times there's a lot of mesoscale structure. And so there's a lot, been a lot of arguments that the mesoscale structure itself is being modified, the aerosols here. So, uh, so we uh, said, well, maybe we need a large-scale seeding cloud clearing experiment. And uh, here's some uh, possible candidates for uh, doing that. Here's a 747 that's been equipped with... Uh, this is fire retardant here, but it's very hydroscopic as it turns out. And this is just water here, and I know water has been used as a seeding agent before. So anyway, this is probably not serious that uh, we, we should be looking at that. But uh, there is this curious idea as to why those pox and holes grow. And uh, I think that, uh, well, well, we'll stop there. And I just, the last thing I want to show here is that the... Uh, uh, the salt machines are not, are, not a new, are not a new thing. I showed you this one, but uh, this picture here is, uh, you may have seen this one, Hark. This is the rain, the rain machine that was put on in Hawaii. And uh, the idea here was that uh, there, was a, there was a boiler in here that actually was run by propane, and they would shovel salt into this, and the idea would be ejected and lofted up and salt the clouds and increase the, increase the rain here. So... Uh, salt machines, uh, well, it's an interesting proposition, and I think the marine stratocumulus clouds do offer us an excellent laboratory for testing some of these ideas, and uh, hopefully the next time I talk I can report on what our results were from, uh, from next summer. Thank you. Questions or comments? Um, Bruce, yeah, very interesting. Um, 
from the ship that you fly into, you get some of it. Right. How the smoke generator is it? Is it very high? And how well characterized? Um, I'll, I'll, Lynn is working on that, so so uh, we're going to try to characterize that before we get in the field. And uh, her sense is that it's probably going to be similar to the affluent that comes from the from a from a ship stack. That's that's the idea. Now uh, that hasn't been fully characterized yet, so we are considering other options too for making CCN. But uh, has anybody done the Because it presumably produces a lot of carbon, especially in droplets. So you wonder whether that's also going to play a role in that. Yeah, I, I'm I w I'm leaving that up to uh, Lynn and John Seinfeld, and that's uh, that's that's. Uh, their, their job to, to look at that. We're also looking at some other CCN sources uh, in terms of uh, the flares. So, uh, but I ha we haven't finalized anything on that. So there's, there's other, other other ways to do this. So. Actually, calculations that we did show that uh, up to about 500, 600 uh, droplets per cc, the effect of giant nuclei is really minimal. Hmm. So if in your stratus clouds the you have relatively low concentration of cloud drops, right. if you want to do a efficient change, uh, probably the best thing to do is first increase the total concentration and then add the giant ones. So the size distribution of your flares should have a wide, I mean, it should be a wide distribution. R right, okay, so that's a, that's a good thought too. So. Yeah, I remember there was a randomized ground-based uh, salt seeding project in India. And I don't know what they used for generators, but that might be something to look into, actually. Yeah. I heard there's various techniques. Uh, yeah. It involves people shoveling salt out the back of an airplane or yeah. something like that. I've or seen some of those planes. Yeah, well, I won't even tell you about our adventures in Chile where we did some... <laughs> Some some uh, well salt salt experiments, but uh, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so out the window. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you 